So there's a few things I want to say as we get into this, and I'm going to try to keep this teaching shorter because we do want to do the demonstration tonight. Um, the majority of diseases that we deal with in prayer, they don't just happen. Now, to the, to the untrained eye, uh, they may appear just to happen, and so we have this kind of seemingly random effect in the universe, and a lot of times people don't really know what to do with that randomness. It, it's, uh, it's unsettling, and if you study even ancient literature, the ancients were very bothered by it. We're certainly bothered by it, and so people often don't know what to think about this, and when they run into it, they're well, they're trying to figure it out. And the Bible suggests, and I, I might even say points to, we could even say maybe more strongly, um, makes the case that a great deal of disease is tied to unseen factors, which we often don't really think very deeply about. And so when we pray for people who are sick, we start with the fundamental premise I forgot to turn on my recorder. Hold on a second here. I assume this is going to be recorded, but it's nice to have your own copy. Um, when we pray for people who are sick, we start with the fundamental premise that um, there's a reason that this disease is here, and the, the baseline reason is that there is sin in the world. So it may not necessarily always be that this person committed this sin but rather that sin in the world, what we call original sin that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, original sin in the world creates what we call fallen nature. And all of creation is affected by this. All of creation is affected by this. I mean, even when we talk about inanimate things like rocks or we talk about atoms, um, we have this thing called entropy, and we realize that uh, the universe is slowly running down, and there's a physical law known as the second law of thermodynamics that seeks to describe all of this. But what it means for us as human beings is that the moment a child is conceived, it's already on its way to death. And so death is an, in an, is an inevitable part of the life that we lead. And yet we fight it, and we fight it because we were actually created by God to live forever. We were created as immortal beings, not that we are immortal in ourselves. We're immortal because he made us immortal by breathing his spirit into us, and that's what gives us that immortality, except sin interrupted that immortality. And so Adam and Eve sinned, and their sin passes to every single human being. Now, I have to say this because, because everywhere I go, I find people who are, shall we say, up in arms um, about loved ones who are dying. But it's inevitable. It's going to happen because of this thing called original sin. And sometimes we can't trace the sickness that somebody has to any one particular thing. We just say, everybody's going to die. I mean, I'm going to die. Bill's going to die. I hate to tell you, Bill, but it's coming. Right, So um, we don't always know when, and when it comes unexpectedly, that's, that's a double hit. But even people who know that you know, grandma is 98 years old and you know, she's ailing, inevitably her time's going to come. It's still a devastating, grief-filled experience when this happens. And I'm saying all this because I want to I really emphasize this thing of original sin. It is not something that is emphasized in renewal circles these days. And it's a very uncomfortable topic. But every single person, I could point at any one of you, you're probably the youngest guy in the room right now. I don't see any babies here. Oh, she's younger than you are. Okay. There's a, one. There's a little kid over there. Every person in this room, even that little boy, even that young girl, even you as a whatever you are, youth of some vintage, uh, everyone's going to die because of this thing called original sin. And we can't escape it. There's only two people in history that have escaped this. One of them was a man named Enoch, who gets way too much press these days, and uh, another was a man named Elijah. So right away, if your name doesn't begin with E, give up. Just give up. And, you know, of all the people who have ever lived, only two <laughs> successfully uh, 
survived death. Even Jesus um, went to death on our behalf. And so we have to reckon with that, and we have to realize that we're not going to explain everything, but we can explain a lot. And the more we learn, the more explainability we come to. And with that, we become better as healers. Now, the Bible gives us a lot of indicators of what kinds of things are there, and to try to elaborate all of that would be way, way, way too much for tonight. Um, I'm attempting to write a book called An Integrated Guide to Healing and Deliverance in which we will uh, explore this in great detail. The first draft of that book vanished when my editor, who had the only working copy of it, had a computer failure and was not backing up her computer. So we're starting over again, and uh, it's a slow and painful process. But um, let's look at a couple of passages that indicate this process that I'm talking about, this kind of thinking, this, this way of going about it. In John chapter 5, we have the story of a man who is healed um, at the pool of Bethesda. And you can still go to this pool today if you go to Jerusalem. And we won't read the entire account, but it says that at the pool of Bethesda there were five, uh, five roofed colonnades. So this pool had five areas that had roofs over them, and there were columns that held up the roof. And so the sick lay underneath these roofs. It would keep the rain off. It would keep the sun off. Uh, but this is where they lay because it was believed that the waters had a special uh, aspect to them in that from time to time an angel would come and would stir the waters. And if you were the first person to get into the water, you would get healed. Now, it's difficult to confirm that this is actually true, but it was definitely believed by them. And I will say in a lot of places of the world, you hear maybe not that story, but stories that have that sort of feel to them. And oftentimes odd things go on and people do find healing and whatnot, whether it's in a grotto or something. So I don't want to just dismiss that story out of hand. So there's a man lying there. And he's among the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And this guy's been there for 38 years. Now, that's, uh, that's a pretty long time to be lying there, you know, underneath these colonnades. I, I guess somebody was feeding him. And when Jesus saw him lying there, uh, he knew that he had already been there a long time. He said, do you want to be healed? Now, that's a crazy question to ask somebody who's sick, except it might not be a crazy question to ask when the problem is that maybe the guy doesn't want to get well. You say, well, who wouldn't want to get well? I was talking with someone just this week, and they had to make a decision about whether they would receive healing from the Lord in a particular context. Somebody came, and it was clear that there was power there to heal. And he had to decide, was he going to let go of the reputation he had built as somebody who had prevailed and overcome, and he got speaking engagements and had written books and had built a ministry around being that guy who served the Lord anyway in the midst of all of his difficulty and hardship. And so he had to decide, do I want to get well? Do I want to lay down the ministry that I've been given in order to find uh, what I would say is divine normalcy? It's not normal for people not to walk or talk, or see. It's true sometimes they, they have these afflictions and maladies, and we don't think less of them for being so. But we have to recognize there that God created us in his image, and we need to have in our mind, what is the divine normal? What, what did God intend? He intended that these eyes would work. He intended that these legs would work. That, that's what he intends. And because of this thing in the world called sin, original sin, or sometimes specific things that happen to us, uh, maybe that doesn't always work as well as it's supposed to. Does this make sense? I'm trying to say this in a way that is not condemning. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I am trying to help us think clearly and sensibly, biblically, about this matter of healing. So Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? And again, it might sound like a ridiculous question, and the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. 
That doesn't really answer the question. He's explaining why he's still lying there. And so he's saying, I'm on my own. And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, what Jesus is really doing is he's, he's interrupting him. <laughs> and he's, he's shutting down an argument that says, oh, me, oh, my, there's no way out of this terrible situation that I'm in. And so in so many words, what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I am taking away your excuse. If you want to be well, listen to my words, get up and walk. And because he's Jesus, the man gets up and he's healed. And then he gets in trouble because it happened on the Sabbath and he's carrying his bed, which Jesus told him to do, and that violates the Sabbath law. But that's a whole other part of the story that we don't need to go into. So in that man's case, something was blocking his ability to be healed. Now, the immediate thing was if the angel stirred the water, he couldn't get in it. But now that Jesus is standing in front of him, there's another means of healing. It's not just an angel. It's the Lord himself. And he has to decide, am I going to take what's offered to me? And I'm not, I'm not turning this into a word of faith message. He has to decide if the means of grace is there, do I actually want it or not? Because I've become so habituated to the circumstance I'm in that that habituation, that mindset that has to be removed, and that's why Jesus addresses it as he does. He's trying to move it off of the field. A lot of times when we pray for people for healing, what we are doing is we're trying to diagnose what is the blockage to the flow of God's divine power in their life in order that they can receive the healing they need. And many of us are not very good diagnosticians, but it's a very, very critical part of the ministry of healing. Here's another story that um, exemplifies the thing that I'm speaking about. If we go back one chapter, or excuse me, one book, and we go to the Gospel of Luke, we have the story of, in this case, another paralytic, but this one isn't lying by the pool of Bethesda. He gets carried in by uh, his friends. It doesn't say how many, but the way I picture it, I think there must be four friends, because they, it says that he's on a stretcher. And so logically, you can think of one man on each corner carrying the pole. Uh, you could have only two men, but I think of it as four. And so Jesus is teaching in Luke 5, 17, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Now, Luke is the only gospel writer who points out this language about the power of the Lord, but he says the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And this seems to suggest... And I say seems and suggest because it's not absolutely rock-solid certain. Is, is Luke just uniquely aware of this because he's a physician? Or is it that there were times when there was greater anointing, when there was something in the room? My experience over the years, particularly when I would uh, travel with John Wimber, is there would be times, <clears throat> excuse me, do I want to be healed? Uh, there would be times when a great anointing would come into the room. And when that great anointing would come into the room, it, we used to call it open season. It was kind of like if you went to the carnival and you went into the shooting gallery, you just shoot at anything you want. And all kinds of stuff would happen, but you never knew if one of those moments like that if it would last for 15 seconds or 15 minutes or an hour. But what you knew was when that anointing was in the room, pretty much anything you tried was going to work. The blind would see, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, all the hard cases would get healed. It was an amazing time thing. So maybe Luke's talking about that. Or maybe just, yeah, Jesus had this power to heal. You could, you could read it both ways. I tend to think that this is a heightened moment. This isn't just an average, everyday thing in the life of Jesus. The power of the Lord was present at that moment. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. <clears throat> but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, and they let him down with his bed through the tiles and into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith... 
He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now note this, he saw their faith. Now there is a plural word. So was he seeing the bed carrier's faith? Probably yes, because they brought him there and they had enough faith to break a hole in the roof. And we're not talking a hole as big as this little pulpit here. We're talking like as long as that row of chairs and maybe even a little bit wider because you've got to be able to lower a stretcher through it. And then is it two friends or four friends? Well, I don't know, but their faith, plural. And then the man may have put them up to it. Hey, get me in front of Jesus so I can get healed. So maybe his faith is involved in it. But Jesus could see faith on these men, however many of them exactly we're talking about. I think that's an important dynamic that we often overlook, that when there's faith in a room, many times, you know, as the speaker, I can look out on the crowd, and if there are particular individuals who have, a, I'll say, a heightened sense of faith or expectation for healing, I can see it on their faith. I know they have faith to be healed. And so many times I can call them out of the crowd not because I'm so good, but just because I recognize they have faith to be healed. I can see faith on them. And when you call them out, a lot of times they'll just stand up and say, that's it, I just got healed, or something like that. So there's, there's, a, there's a catalytic and dynamic aspect here that I think we often miss. Many, many times people want this to be a very static thing. Will you just claim the word? No, I think there is this dynamic almost flowing aspect of the spirits moving in the room, and Jesus is going with that. And so as he sees the faith of whether it's two, three, four, or five, if it's two bed carriers, then them. If it's the two bed carriers and the man, then that's three. If it's four bed carriers and the man doesn't have faith, well, then that's four, and if the man had faith too, then that's five. Take it any way you want. I don't care. So anyway, he sees their faith, but now seeing their faith, whatever their means, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And no one's used to hearing anyone say that. And so the scribes and the Pharisees begin to question and saying, who can say this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus, Jesus perceives their thoughts, so he's got a word of knowledge that's allowing him to understand what they're thinking in their minds and he says, why do you question your hearts, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Well, it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven because it's not measurable. It's simply something that sounds impressive. John Wimber used to say, much of the church plays basketball without hoops, meaning they don't want to keep score, but they can all go, and it looks very impressive, but you don't actually know whether they've scored. And so that's kind of in this realm, right? Well, it's much easier to say your sins are forgiven. But to say rise and walk, now that seems truly difficult. So in order that you may know that the Son of Man actually does have authority to forgive sins, he says to the man who is paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up that, or what he had been lying on. And he went home glorifying God, and amazement seized them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Well, what are we supposed to learn from this passage with what we're talking about tonight? It's that there was an underlying dynamic in that man's life, and in his particular case, emphasize his particular case. He actually did have some kind of sin problem. Now, back in the 1970s and the 1980s, there were some teachers who said, if you weren't healed, it's because you had sin in your life. I don't think that's universally true, but it can be true in particular cases. And in his particular case, why would Jesus have bothered to say, your sins are forgiven, except that without those sins, unnamed, we don't know what they were, without those being forgiven, he would never have received the healing that he needed. Because Jesus doesn't waste words. God doesn't waste words. One of the um, doctrines of God that if you study systematic theology, nobody does unless they're in seminary. But theologians think about this stuff, and they've been writing about it for a long time. It's called the perspicuity of God. Nobody even knows what the word perspicacious means anymore. But it's basically to be minimalist in your use of language. 
So you wouldn't say anything or do anything unless it were necessary. And so the perspicuity of God tells us that Jesus would not have said, your sins are forgiven unless that man needed his sins to be forgiven. Now we're talking about cancer tonight. So what is something that might be in the substrate that could be a cause of cancer? Well, there are a few. One of them is bitterness. And it used to be when I first started praying for the sick and learning about this and hanging around some of the greats of another era, I guess, uh, that the the go-to answer was, if you had cancer, you were bitter. And what that usually was intended to mean was that you were unforgiving towards somebody who had wronged you. And that might be true sometimes. I'm not going to dismiss that one out of hand. Uh, That can be true, that people who are bitter can develop cancer. But it's not the only reason, and, and it's not even, I don't think, the majority reason why people might end up with cancer. Um, but it is, it is a, a factor. So one of the things we think about when we pray for people who have cancer is we gently, diplomatically, and I might say, Bill, you'll appreciate this because you're an attorney, without leading the witness, um, we try to discern and ascertain whether they might have some unforgiveness towards someone. Now, it could be somebody long in their past. It may be somebody more current. It could be a family member. It could be somebody they no longer associate with. Um, If they were ever mugged or anything like that, it might be their attacker, especially if there was any lasting damage. So any or all of this could apply, but bitterness might be on that list. But listen, bitterness doesn't have to be only uh, directed at other people. Sometimes we have bitterness towards ourselves. Sometimes we call that uh, unforgiveness of self. Or some people like to say the inability to love yourself, the ability to let yourself off the hook. Or maybe even just the ability to like yourself. I remember my mother. Now, she did die of cancer. I think her story is somewhat different from this line of thought. Uh, But I will say when she was alive and I was a lot younger, Uh, There were times that my own mother would say, I hate myself. I'm a horrible person. And I'd say, what do you mean you're a horrible person? You're a wonderful person. Everybody likes you. You're kind and so on. She was a nurse. She never really had conflicts with people. But, But she had something in there towards herself that she couldn't let go of. And she ended up developing stomach cancer. And, And again, I think her story is different. I don't think the root of it was this inability to love herself. But that kind of talk, that kind of thought, doesn't have to be articulated out of the lips. It can simply be held in the mind or in the heart. And there are a lot of people who, I mean, they have body image issues. I don't like my body. Or they, I'm stupid. I'm never going to amount to anything. My parents always said I was stupid and I'll, I'll never, I am stupid. They were right. Well, who's to say? I mean, God made you. And so shall the, shall the pot say to the potter, why have you made me thus? And so there's, there's this kind of um, problem that can be there. Again, the, the nature of what's wrong with this man on this stretcher in this story in Luke 5 is not disclosed. And I think that's the wisdom of God that it's not disclosed. Because if it were, everybody thereafter would say, aha, if you're paralyzed, you have that sin that he had. But they may not have that sin. They may have something altogether different if it's a causal effect. So now we're starting to talk about this matter of roots. And as I said, it may be externally focused as bitterness or hatred, but it might be internally focused as self-bitterness or self-loathing or self-hatred. Now, there are a couple of um, places where we might think about this. The word cancer does not occur in the Bible, but in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Lord does speak of wasting disease. 
and um, he, it actually says that if you via, if you abandon the Lord, the Lord will um, strike you with wasting disease. And the word that's used in Hebrew normally refers to what we call consumption, or today, um, um, the word just went right out of my head. Come on, Margaret, help me. Thank you. T um, tuberculosis. But tuberculosis eats you up and cancer eats you up. And what I've learned is that there's a lot of similarities between all of these wasting diseases of whatever sort they may be, whether it's cancer or tuberculosis or muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis or what we call ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. <clears throat> I think the proper word for it is amitral lateral sclerosis. But any of these wasting diseases that basically shrivel people up and they literally rob the imago dei, the image of God, the, 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 whether it's the handsomeness or the beauty, male or female, of a human being and just draws them into this shrunken shell of a human being. All of these things have a similar dynamic to them. So in Deuteronomy 28, when it speaks of wasting disease, that's where we're going with it. We also have this uh, in the book of Psalms, chapter 38. I've taught on this uh, particular psalm in depth um, elsewhere, dealing with the topic of grief. And I'm not going to talk about grief tonight at all. I just want to read some language from the Psalms. And by the way, to get this to get this clean, you really need a good Bible translation. And in English, there's only three that qualify. Three that qualify. Only three. The others don't even bother to ask because they don't. They're not. They're not careful enough with their hewing to the literal language of the Hebrew text to get you there. One is the English Standard Version. That's what I'm using tonight. Uh, the New King James is another, and the other is the New American Standard, the 1995 version. And I'm aware that a lot of people like the NIV or the Passion or whatever. Those are designed to try to capture the sense of a passage. They're what we call a paraphrase. But if you really want to know what's it saying in Hebrew, you need something that's trying to be as close to the Hebrew or Greek, if it's the New Testament, as possible. And here's how this version of the Bible renders this. And again, I'm skipping all the talk about grief tonight on purpose, but I do want to just listen to the language here. David is describing something that's going on in his own body. This is the king of Israel. This is the righteous man. Well, except for that one peccadillo, but, but for the most part, he's the man after God's own heart. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. Well, the indignation ties us right back into the Deuteronomy 28 passage and this idea of wasting disease. But the lack of soundness in your flesh, this is corruption in our cells. It might be in our skin. It could be in our muscles. It could be our organs, our brain. But there's no soundness. It, you know, it's, it lacks integrity. And you know, many times people who develop cancer, they have a particular look about their skin. It can look kind of waxy, yellowish, gray. Uh, oftentimes they have great pain, and if you even lay your hand on them gently, it's very painful. A lot of cancer patients can't even have bed sheets on them because just that weight alone is too much for them to take. There is no health in my bones. And here David says, because of my sin. He doesn't say which sin. He might be referring to the Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite sin, uh, or maybe it's something else. But anyway, so this is affecting not only his, his flesh, it's affecting his bones. And of course, we know there is bone cancer. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. So what's David saying? Well, the nature of whatever is bothering him is rooted in sin and iniquity. I mean, it's right there in the text. We are trained to read the Bible in the West um, not, I would say, closely. It's not always meant to be taken literally, but more often than not, it is. And unless it's clearly intended to be allegorical, we could, we could miss the importance of what David is saying. He uses, on the one hand, the word sin, which means that which I've done unwittingly, but it was still wrong in your eyes, and I basically got tripped up by it. 
And on the other hand, he talks about iniquities, which are things that are passed on in the family line. Oh, well, that's interesting. So that what David is clearly saying, clearly saying, is that whether or not it's cancer in his case, although it might be because the description is, is again, it's not using the word cancer, but it's similar to the kinds of symptomatic effect that we see cancer giving in people's bodies. He's saying, on the one hand, my unwitting sin, when I violated what you want me to do and I didn't do it because I didn't even know, that's giving me this sort of uh, symptom. And on the other hand, I've got things in my bloodline that have gone over my head. They're higher than I can think about or manage, and they're like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. And so now boom, they come down upon me, and David says, my wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. Well, what are these wounds? It, they could be the wounds that a soldier experiences. I mean, he was a soldier, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. Sometimes people, when they get these wasting diseases, how about this? They get bed sores. Anyone ever seen anyone with bed sores? They're horrible, and they don't heal quickly. And once they open, they, they can stink and fester. Or these may be if a cancer erupts on the surface of the skin, comes up through the body wall or something, he may be speaking of that. Again, it's not specific, it's not clear, but we're just thinking descriptively of what the Hebrew language is describing. And it's, he says it's because of my foolishness. Now, he's not saying I'm stupid. He's saying I did things in ignorance that were contrary to your ways and they came down upon me. That's what he's saying. That's what it means to be foolish. And I'm utterly bowed down and prostrate, and all day long I go about mourning, for my sides are filled with burning. Well, if you've ever been around somebody who's got cancer, one of the worst aspects of cancer is the extreme pain that people go into because these tumors that are growing inside of them often press on their neurons, and the only thing we know to do is to medicate them with some, some opioid or other. It used to be morphine, but now they're using more powerful opioids than that. So my sides are filled with burning, and there's no soundness in my flesh. We've already seen that language. And I'm feeble and crushed. And if you've ever seen an advanced cancer case, they look feeble. And, well, I don't know if crushed is quite the right word, but I used the word shriveled up a few minutes ago. And I groan because of the tumult of my heart. And a lot of times if you're around cancer patients, they're, they're oh, oh. It even hurts to breathe. So, again, is David describing cancer? Not clear. He might be. Maybe he's not. But he is clearly tying this kind of affliction to things that are in his life which need to be addressed. And then he goes on and he continues with his prayer. I, I'm not going to dwell on all of that. So we have this reference to wasting disease in Deuteronomy. We have this psalm, and we have these ideas about bitterness and hatred that are directed outward as well as directed inward. And then the last thing I want to just make mention of here, this isn't so much about cancer, but maybe a way of dealing with it that I often use, is found in Mark chapter 11. Of course, my pages are sticking together, so give me a moment. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus enters Jerusalem, what's known as the triumphal entry. It's Palm Sunday. And so the day after Palm Sunday, so it's Monday morning, on the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. He went to see if he could find anything on it, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Now, Mark specifically points this out. It's not Figsheim. And Jesus should have known this. He would have known this, because anybody in the Holy Land in that era would have known it. It was an agrarian society. 
everybody was a farmer or a fisherman or maybe a tradesman, but nobody is more than two steps away from the agrarian life of the land. People who live in New York City might not know that because you know, who's growing figs in New York, right? So you wouldn't have any knowledge of the agricultural cycle and the seasons of the year and so forth. But anyway, because he finds no figs, he says to the fig tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. And there have been all kinds of things said about this. I, I, I have a lot of things I could say about this passage, but let's just stay with what happened phenomenologically. So he, as they say, cursed the fig tree. And it doesn't appear to be even a very strong imprecation. You know, he doesn't say, in the name of God himself, may you die from the roots. You know, none of that kind of thing. It just says, may you never bear fruit again. It's a prophetic action, I think, that he's doing, speaking of the fruitlessness of Israel. But anyway, verse 20, and they passed by the next morning, <clears throat> and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. So it had shriveled, as it were, from the top down. The leaves are all withered up. There's nothing left. The, the branches are, well, the woody parts are probably still strong, but the more tender parts of the branches, they are drooping, limping. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. You know, there's incredible power in a spoken word, spoken in under unction and spoken in faith. Let me say this emphatically. This is not a formula, what I'm about to say. Absolutely, positively, categorically, not a formula. But it does work when it's said under unction and anointing. You can speak to cancer and you can say, may you shrivel from the roots, may you never bear fruit again, and when spoken under the anointing, it will cause cancer in the body to die just the way this fig tree died. But it's not a formula. So you might be sitting there going, well, then when do we say it? When you know the anointing is there. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, because the power of the Lord was present to heal the sick, your sins are forgiven, rise and walk, boom, boom, it happened. When the anointing is there, things happen. When the anointing isn't there, it's just words spoken into the air. Does this make sense to everybody? That's why I said I want to be emphatically clear about this, but it is a tool that we use when praying for cancer. So now that we understand the basic concept of roots and we understand some of the things that might give rise to something that behaves like cancer or is cancer, uh, let's talk about um, three specific kinds of cancer. The first is stomach cancer. Um, what are the roots that might be engaged in stomach cancer? Well, on the soul realm, which deals with our memories and our emotions, uh, we might have been overly concerned, and as we often say, had our stomach in knots, um, maybe about what others think about us or about our performance. Now, we, we know just empirically that if you're in a job where your performance is being evaluated all the time and you're not measuring up, which, by the way, may not necessarily be the same thing as you're not doing a good job. You could have a hypercritical boss or someone who's out to get you. They just want to bury you alive and get you out the door. You might be doing fine. But still, if you're in that environment, we know empirically if you're around that long enough, you'll develop, what do we call them? Ulcers. Okay, so that's hitting you in your stomach, isn't it? And is there anything physically wrong with your stomach? Probably not, but you have what we call stress, anxiety, fear of job loss. And with that, your stomach starts to secrete extra acids and they you know, eat holes in the side of the stomach. Okay, well, similar to that, but not the same, with stomach cancer, if someone's overly concerned about what others think about them and they are constantly in knots uh, or worried about their performance, I think that might be a root of stomach cancer. Now, is it always a root? No, of course not. I'm trying to give you some pathways to go down, things to explore. And so the kinds of questions you would ask diagnostically when praying for somebody with 
stomach cancer, it would be, have you had a concern about how you're doing or how others are perceiving you, what you think about? In my mother's case, I think one of the roots for her, there were some others too, but one of them was that when she was learning to drive, my grandfather took her out to drive in one of those older, you know, cars of the 19, like late 30s, early 40s. Everything was a stick shift. No one had heard of automatic transmission. And she couldn't get the clutch thing worked out. And so she popped the clutch a few times and the car stalled. And my grandfather was a very irascible man, um, very short-tempered, and he began screaming at her and yelling at her about her inability to drive, told her she would never know how to drive, told her to drive the car home, we're done, all this sort of thing. And it really addled her because my mother was a mild woman who didn't have the constitution to be around that kind of treatment. Does that make sense? I'm looking in the crowd at my friend, I won't call you out and embarrass you, but you work in a hyper-stress environment where there's a lot of yelling and screaming and things like that. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a higher than normal incidence, both of ulcers and stomach cancer among your peers and colleagues. Just saying because of what I'm talking about. He has a job down, down in the financial district here, a very high-stress job. Okay, so... Um, that might be in the soul realm. How about in the spirit realm? Because the spirit is not the soul. And oftentimes our human spirits are affected by things around us. So in the spirit realm, we might have perhaps fear of man. And it might lead to perhaps extreme self-bitterness. And we've already talked about what that means. The inability to like yourself or to forgive yourself or to give yourself a break. It could also result maybe in rebellion or spirits of death coming in. So our spiritual aspect, uh, which is where sin always wants to lay hold of us, these things can attach. And one of the things I think that has really hindered healing ministry in the last 25 or 30 years is the widespread teaching of it was all done at the cross. Now let me be clear, it was all done at the cross. We're not, in, we're not disputing that statement. There remains no further sacrifice to be given. But the way this has been rendered into popular Christian culture is the idea that once you do something wrong, you don't need to worry about that. It was all covered when you believed in Jesus. But actually, the scripture says we are to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles. And it's, it's not always sin that we intended to commit. It's not always sin that we even knew was wrong. We, we already talked about David using a word out of, we didn't look at the Hebrew word, but the Hebrew word underneath the word just generic sin means I did wrong without knowing it was wrong. Then there's other sin that I knew was wrong when I did it, and then there's yet other sin that I inherit. So there are these different types of pernicious effect, but the scripture says we should lay aside all sin that so easily entangles. And it, one of the things it might entangle us with is sickness. We don't tend to think about that because we don't think about our bodies, our very existence as an integration of our spiritual life, our soul, which is our mind and emotions, principally memories, um, and then our bodies, and then where appropriate, the realm of the demonic. But all these things are in play, and so we're, it's a bit like a Rubik's Cube. We're kind of looking at all the angles, trying to figure out, okay, where is the angle of attack, and how did the evil one exploit this thing called original sin, which he set us up for, and then lay a tripwire that we went across, and now that's gone active in this person's life. And if we get that thing removed... Now the power of God can flow and healing can occur. Does this make sense? We all together? Yeah? Okay. As my friend Adam would say, he's an Australian. You're all sitting there looking like stunned mullets. All right, so that might be an example of how stomach cancer arises. Now, again, not all stomach cancer in every case is going to have what I just described, but I'm trying to give you just a few tools to take away diagnostically that you might use going forward. Now let's talk about female cancers. Now when we say female cancers, we mean cancers that are unique to women because of unique body parts that women have, which men do not have. So we'd be talking about the chest, and we'd be talking about the reproductive organs, uh, principally the cervix, um, the ovaries, and the uterus. 
uh, there could be some other, but but those are the big three that we think of in the lower part of the anatomy. Well, in the physical realm, the causes of uh, female cancers, there's human papillomavirus, or HPV, which is a, a plague in our society now because of the immorality in our society. One friend of mine has it, and, and um, she's, she knows likely who gave it to her, but, you know, that's long in the past, and she's still living with the effect of it. On the other hand, um, it may not be physically caused. It may not be something like HPV. It may be that in the realm of the soul, uh, there's leftover grief or wounding or what we commonly call trauma, although I think that word is highly overused today, so I tend not to use it. Uh, but it arises from having been molested or raped. So what's the difference between molestation and rape? We tend, to, we tend to want to fuzz this over and just talk about, I was sexually abused. We need to be more specific when we're trying to heal cancer. Were you molested or were you raped? Molestation is inappropriate touch. Rape is penetration. And there is a difference, um, both psychologically as well as physically between those two. And I'm not thereby trying to minimize if you've been molested, if you're a woman here, and say it doesn't matter. It matters immensely. I'm just saying they're not the same thing. And if we try to broad stroke everything in order to avoid having to use certain words, we never really get down into the nitty gritty and get that stuff cleaned out. Does that make sense? Okay. So... Um, what does that look like when it's in the realm of the soul? Well, maybe this woman doesn't want to be a woman uh, because it makes her vulnerable. Or, as with often happens to women who have been subjected to either molestation or rape, we could say they let themselves go. Uh, they begin putting on weight. Maybe they take comfort from food. Or maybe they consciously put on weight. They eat too much all the time because... Women know that in general that's a way to make sure men don't pay much attention to you. And so they may go down that pathway. Um, but they, they, begin, they begin having this, this disregard and this hatred for the fact that they are women because of what happened to them in that experience or series of experiences. All of this is in the realm of the soul. It deals with the memories uh, or the emotions. But then there's the spiritual dynamics. Again, maybe not wanting to be a woman, but they might even go so far as to say, um, so this isn't, this. I want to be sure I say this the right way. I'm not talking now about molestation and rape, but rather I don't want to be a woman because maybe my parents wanted a boy. And I never really got beyond that, and so I've always felt less than because I'm a woman. Hint, hint, this is one of the roots of transgenderism as well, but we're not talking about transgenderism tonight, we're talking about cancer. And so a woman like that may, as it were, curse her own body. I wish I weren't a woman. I wish I'd been born a man. And I've met many women from many countries. It's less common in the U.S. among I'm, I'm almost afraid to make this statement because I'm a, I know someone's going to accuse me of being racist and I'm not. I'm simply trying to be clear and clinical. But among white women, it's less common. But among women who come from uh, countries that don't have brown, uh, don't have white skin, they're either black or brown or Melanesian, it's far more common for those societies to prefer boys over girls. And consequently, many of those women have an innate self-hatred of their womanhood and with it, they have a higher incidence of these kinds of female cancers. Does that make sense? So again, please no one accuse me of being a racist. I've just traveled widely. I've prayed for hundreds of thousands of people, and I know what I've seen to be the patterning, and after a while, you learn to recognize those patterns. Now, that's a spiritual thing, and again, it has nothing to do with molestation, although if you were raised in such a society and you got molested or raped, well, then you'd have two layers of it, wouldn't you? And so now it's, it's, it's being made more complex. How are we going to unravel all of this in order to get God's power to flow so that the cancer in the body can be healed? 
All right. Um, and then third uh, example I want to talk about, and this is what we're going to pray for tonight, is pancreatic cancer. Now, the pancreas is part of the liver system, and it feeds insulin into the liver for the purpose of breaking down uh, complex carbohydrates. And um, so in the physical realm, the liver produces something called bile, but it has another name, which is gall, G-A-L-L. -L. And of course, most of us have heard the term gall bladder. Well, the gallbladder is connected to the liver. It's kind of in the lower part. But the gallbladder um, collects bile and stores it and then releases it for purposes of metabolizing in the intestines. And it's interesting, in the Bible, Peter, when he's dealing with Simon Magus, Simon the magician, in Acts 8.23, he says, that I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. Now, that's an interesting thing to say. Bile by its nature, not that any of us would go around tasting it, but it is by its nature a bitter, kind of acidic, sharp sort of thing. And so Peter speaks to Simon Magus, and he says to him, he is caught in the gall of bitterness. So when we start talking about liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, gallbladder cancer, we need to be thinking about gall in particular, and we at least need to check if there's bitterness there. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that someone with pancreatic cancer or, or gallbladder cancer or liver cancer is a bitter person, but they might well be, and they might even not realize that they have that bitterness because they've lived with it for so long, they can't recognize it, similar to the man that Jesus was addressing at the Pool of Bethesda, the story that we talked about at the very front of this teaching tonight. And so when we think about um, the, the, the entire liver, pancreatic, gallbladder system, the liver is producing this bile or this gall, and Peter goes on and he says to Simon, not only are you caught in the gall of bitterness, but you are uh, caught in the bond of iniquity. Now, maybe this was an ancestral thing in his family. Maybe he came from a family that had a history of being bitter. And what do we know about Simon? This is empirical, and you, don't, you, don't, you just got to read the Scripture, and you'll see it. Simon, he had convinced everybody he was the great guy. He said, the, the Scripture uses the language of he was known as the great power. And everybody gave great attention to Simon. So he liked being Mr. Big. And he used his magical powers, and the Bible takes those as literally true. So he used his magical powers to, you know, throw his weight around, as it were, and to garner attention. And now here comes something greater than the power that he has, and he immediately recognizes that it's greater. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what does he do? He comes to Peter and he offers him money and he says, give me this ability so that everyone upon whom I lay my hands will also receive the Holy Spirit. Simon is not particularly at that moment chiefly interested in being able to get people baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, he is, but that's like way down in his list of priorities. What he really wants is to be known still as Mr. Big. And that's why Peter says to him, may your money perish with you, perish with you. Who knows? Maybe Simon had something going on that the scripture doesn't make mention of. I don't know. That's more speculative. But Peter does say you are caught in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. And so this all needs to get out of you, Simon, because sooner or later it's going to take you to a bad place. And that's empirically verifiable from Scripture. The part about uh, the part about him, you know, with his family history and all that. That's that maybe is a little more speculative. But anyway, here's what else we know about pancreatic cancer. So that's all the physical realm, the liver producing uh, bile or gall. <clears throat> the second thing is um, in the soul realm. The book of Proverbs speaks of an arrow piercing the liver as the result of adultery, specifically affairs. That's in Proverbs 7.23. Now, again, we are trained to read passages like that as though 
they are purely metaphorical. And of course, not everyone is going to have an arrow, you know, come in and pierce them. But that part of it is metaphorical. But the idea of it landing in your liver complex, so gallbladder, pancreas, liver, as a result of any kind of sexual defilement or immorality, this is something that most of us have never thought about. But I've known a number of people who contracted one of those three cancers and died of them because of that exact thing. Now, here's what's interesting. Back on Deuteronomy 28, the Lord says, if you'll live according to my ways, I'll keep you safe from all of these things. What's one of the Ten Commandments? We're talking about Proverbs 7. There you go. Do not commit adultery. So if you want to not have your liver, gallbladder, or pancreas get pierced with that arrow, stay out of adultery. When you're married, you're married. That's it. That's not taught widely in our churches today. It's taught even less widely in our society. It's kind of a given in church, but we tend to be sort of, yeah, well, this is just the way it goes. You know, people slip up, and so there's grace. And there is grace, but I could tell you some very high-profile people with whom I've had associations who, when I went, went to them and they were dying of one of these three cancers, I said, look, I have to ask you a very personal question. I hate to ask this. I'm sorry, but I need to know. Did you ever have an affair? Did you ever commit adultery? And at least with this sample set of people, the, it was a 100% yes, I did. And it was all buried and forgotten and not disclosed and hidden in the darkness. Now, to be clear, we're going to pray for someone with pancreatic cancer. I don't know if this person's committed adultery, and I'm not accusing them of it. I'm simply saying that this is another causal route that we need to be aware of when we're dealing with the liver system. Does that make sense? And I'm trying to be very articulate about what I'm saying because of late I've had a lot of people hearing things I'm not saying and not hearing things that I am saying. So I'm saying it two or three different ways and with great firmness in order that nobody grab it and go somewhere with it that I didn't intend for it to go. Does that make sense? All right, so we've talked about the physical realm. We've talked about the soul realm. And then there's the spiritual realm. And this one's a little... Odd, but I'll just tell you, having talked with more than a few witch doctors, uh, both current practicing and also now converted and in the faith, who have gone through massive deliverance and maybe been away from it for 20 or 30 years, uh, in my travels in places like India and Indonesia, um, Nepal, and in multiple African nations, uh, witchcraft is often associated with the liver system. Often. Now, again, not universally. None of this is always. So I can't always tell you what's the root of why someone's got this cancer. But what I can tell you is what is, are common enough that you at least want to check. Now, if I'm in Nebraska, I'm probably not going to be overly worried about witchcraft. In New York City, with whatever it is, 160 different nationalities living here, many of which come out of societies that openly practice witchcraft. And by the way, I didn't mention Haiti and the Dominican Republic or Colombia and Venezuela and some of the you know, countries down there. Witchcraft is nearly universal. And so you, know, you at least need to ask, has this person, A, ever been involved in it, or B, ever been around people who are involved in it, or C, known someone who might want to curse them in order that they would die? You say, does anyone do that? Oh, yeah, all the time they do it. I just came back from Albania, and, I mean, all of the Balkans are shot straight through with all of it. And it's all of those nations, Montenegro and Macedonia and Albania and you know, Serbia, and we just keep on naming names, but it's all through that entire society. They do it in Greece. They do it in Italy. You say, wait a minute, Greece is supposed to be Greek Orthodox and Italy is supposed to be Catholic. Uh-huh. <laughs> a lot of times people mingle their Christian faith with whatever other local practices are available. So these are things that we have to dig around and figure out, is it there? If it's there, then we have to 
whether it's a curse, break it. Um, if it's something they did wrong in the realm of sin, we uncover it and then we pray into that. Um, in one case with one individual who I won't name because a well-known figure, uh, this individual actually did have adultery and confessed it to me the very last time I saw him. And he'd never, he'd never come clean before that, but he told me the whole story. So we prayed, and it was an unbelievably powerful encounter with the Lord. And I left on a trip the following day. And so as we finished, I said, well, brother, either you just got healed or I'm going to see you in heaven. And I'm not sure which one it is. I mean, I'd see him in heaven anyway, but you know what I mean by that. Uh, well, he died. So I think what happened was the cancer had gotten so far advanced that basically we brought the right medicine too late. You say, is that a thing? Yeah, I think it can be a thing. And so it's a good thing if you know you have some of these factors in your own life. Confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. That's in James 5. And it, it, that passage is a New Testament passage that clearly suggests that without naming any particular sin or form of it, uh, that there can be times whether sin sent against you or that you've been the recipient of or sin that you have yourself sinned, whether knowingly or unknowingly, um, all of this can be something that is underlying the physical maladies that ail us. And so we want to be quick to repent and keep short accounts with God. All right. Well, I said I was going to talk short, and I did about an hour, so that's probably long enough for a short message. And uh, if anyone wants to have a question or two, I'll do that, and then we'll uh, do our demonstration. I'm going to give you the mic. So in 1 Samuel, there's a story of the Philistines who were trying to mess with the ark, and that's one of the, and, and what befell on them was that they all had tumors. In your experience, have you found that story or what happened to that story to line up with any causes of any other cancers? Because it does name tumors. Yeah. So the Philistine story, those tumors could have been cancer. They could have been something else. More commonly, cancer is you know inside the body, not erupting through the skin. But advanced cases of it, of particular types, can and do erupt through the skin. So I don't know if that was cancer um, because the scripture isn't clear. But what I'll say about that is I have known people who have been careless with the holiness of God. And that's what those Philistines were doing. They, you know, they had the ark and they were, yeah, it's just a religious artifact. Like all the other ones that we capture from all the other nations when we make war with them. And then we gather all that loot into the you know, house of Dagon, who was their god, and we... Uh, you know, we do what we do, and nothing ever comes of it, and they didn't realize what they were playing with. And I think a lot of times that happens. So I've known people who um, perhaps they were not consecrated Christians and they were a little too loose or with certain things. Uh, and I've also known people who were non-believers and were like, yeah, whatever, I can do anything I want because there's nothing to all this religion. These are just, you know bread and wine or a cross or a whatever. You know who else made this mistake, by the way, but with a different outcome, he didn't get a tumor, is Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, who succeeded Nebuchadnezzar. Because remember, he was holding the feast with his thousand nobles, and he says, hey, get all the gold vessels out of the temple of the Lord that we have here from when we ransacked Jerusalem. And so they bring them all out, and now they're drinking in the, in the goblets, and they've got the gold platters, and they're having this big banquet. And suddenly this hand appears and writes on the wall, and it says he became pale. That's not cancer. It just, oh, my gosh, what's that? And it writes out, mene, mene, tekel, upharsin, and that very night his kingdom was taken from him. And so the scripture speaks of this thing of not blaspheming the Lord that... that um, it's actually written to Christians in 1 Corinthians 10. It says that uh, certain things happened among them in order that they would be taught not to blaspheme. And we live in a blasphemous society. Think about the things that are aired. Think about some of the movies that are coming out, the things that mock the Lord, all of this and more. And so I think there are people, they wouldn't hopefully be in the church, but they might be, um, but generally, among outsiders, 
where they can run afoul of the Lord because of the things that they're engaged in without it necessarily turning to, to cancer. So I answered more than you asked, but I figured since we're here, we might as well throw it in. All right, other questions? Oh, yeah, I was right there. Um, what might be some spiritual roots of respiratory diseases or lung, lung cancer? Um, those are two different things, respiratory disease and lung cancer. Uh, a lot of respiratory diseases from what I've seen, things like uh, uh, asthma in particular, and um, a pretty high percentage of emphysema, uh, these tend to be afflicting spirits. Remember, the word spirit is pneuma. It's the same word as breath. In both Pneuma in Greek can be either spirit or breath, which is interesting. And this is, by the way, why when evil spirits leave people, most commonly they leave from this region and they come out through the mouth or the nose with sneezing, coughing, maybe yawning, um, sometimes vomiting, but all of these are, <coughs> they're related to the breathing apparatus. So the very word spirit tells you that they, in particular, seem to like the respiratory uh, tract as either an exit pathway or um, a place to lodge. And so what I've seen is that a lot of allergies, um, asthma, as I mentioned, and emphysema, uh, many times there will be afflicting spirits there. Where do they come from? Well, they can come from a lot of things. It can be generational. Uh, but, but the most common thing that I find they come from, it's not the only thing. I always have to keep emphasizing these are not, none of these is always or never. But one of the most common is that people um, have dabbled with a foreign god, even if they're Christians. And I'll tell you guys, this is not going to be popular. I'm about to throw a grenade in the middle of the room. Everybody duck. Yoga. Because yoga is Hinduism. And a lot of times people that are Christians, they start dabbling in yoga, and they find that they're starting to have both bodily problems, spinal problems, et cetera, but especially upper respiratory and sinus type stuff. And if they had it before, it worsens. And if they didn't have it, it comes on. And then they wonder, where did it come from? And the answer is... Well, because you were worshiping a Hindu god when you were doing your yoga, or maybe more than one Hindu god. And I've just found that to be really common for people who get tangled up in that. There's, there are other religious entanglements you could indulge in. Um, meditation, and I'm not talking about Christian meditation. I'm talking about something more like transcendental meditation or Buddhist meditation, things like that. Uh, and people who maybe decide, hey, Bill Clinton did it when he was president. Let's go down to Haiti and go into the, uh, the spirit house when they're, when they're calling the spirits and engaging in their, um, you know, their voodoo-type ceremonies. Bill Clinton said it was the most spiritual experience he ever had when he went to Haiti and did that. He said it on the public record. You can find it if you go look for it. Well... So if it's good enough for the president, why shouldn't I do it? Why can't I do it? Sounds kind of cool to me. Now, these are generally going to be unconsecrated Christians, but let me tell you something. And this is a, this is a newer phenomenon. I've, I've only started running into this, you know, a lot in the last maybe two or three years. Um, there's a new uh, psychoactive, psychedelic drug called ayahuasca that's very, very popular. It grows in Central and South America. And people are going down in droves from Christian churches of a renewal stream ilk to go take ayahuasca to open their third eye and have powerful psychedelic experiences because they are saying they want to become more powerful in the prophetic. This is, I'm, I'm not kidding when I'm saying this. I know I just threw another grenade in the middle of the room. But, but I went to one very well-known church, won't say where, and I cast spirits of false prophecy and ayahuasca out of 35 of their leaders because they'd all gone down to go on one of these retreats so they could have their, 
great transcendent spiritual experience, well, the good news is they all got delivered, and most of them got rid of a bunch of respiratory problems too. Now let's talk about lung cancer because it's a it's its own beast. Mm -hmm. So lung cancer is almost never a primary cancer. If it is, you've been working in a paint factory or maybe living in a house that has radon gas coming up from underneath from the ground. That's why they have, you know, in certain parts of the country, they want to put radon counters and you check for radioactivity. When that's happening, that is a physical cause and you need to pray about the physical causes of the cancer. But that's not the main thing with, with lung cancer. Lung cancer is usually, Wenwei's back there and he's nodding. He's an oncologist, a researcher in oncology. He, I mean, he can fact check anything I'm saying, but at least so far he's nodding. Um, so lung cancer is usually a secondary cancer that emerges when some other bodily cancer has gone metastatic. And so when I, when I meet someone who says, I have lung cancer, I ask them, did you work in a paint factory? Did you smoke for 20 years? Uh, it could be cigars or cigarettes, all you cigar smokers. Uh, you know, could you, or, or, you know, did you live in a house that had radon gas? Something of this type, no, I didn't. Okay, then where else have you had cancer? And many times they're a cancer survivor and it, they thought they had beat it, but now it's coming back and it's presenting in the lungs. And they don't realize that that's what's going on. Uh, or um, that, that question alone sends them back to their doctor and they now start looking and what do you know? They found cancer in the stomach or the gallbladder or the liver or the you know, pancreas or wherever other places you get cancer. And it, sure enough, it's migrated. So that's the way I think about lung cancer. It's not my primary enemy. I want where it started, because if I get the root, I can usually get all of the bad fruit. But if I don't get the root, then it's not gonna be as successful most of the time. Now, of course, at any point, God can interrupt and do a miracle and clean somebody out and bada boom, bada bing, it's all over with. That does happen. But we're not talking about that one. We're talking about how do we go about systematically thinking about this problem of cancer in order that we can pray for people who have it. And so I don't, I don't principally worry about the lung cancer. It'll kill you, but if, it, if it's there, it's usually because something else is there. Let's deal with the something else, and the lung cancer will get taken care of on the way. and none of the other factors apply? Um, I don't know the answer to that one, to be perfectly honest with you. I could, I could guesstimate, but I'm not sure I would know. I'd need to talk with them a bit more. And this is one of the other things. I'm giving you some general rules and guidelines, but one of the things I've learned is that um, the interview process, the conversation with the, the person who's got whatever it is, this is essential to a good healing experience because a lot of times we uncover things we didn't think we were going to run into and suddenly we realize, oh yeah, okay, now we need to be dealing with that. So um, let me just give an example. I wouldn't say that this is a, this isn't a trend, it's more of an experience I had. You don't build trends out of one or two times. You build trends out of seeing it happen multiple cases. But I've prayed for a few people who had lung cancer like that, meaning they didn't have, they didn't live over radon, they didn't work in a paint factory, they weren't smokers, you know, those sorts of things. And they didn't have cancer in their body elsewhere. Um, I prayed with them, but in, the, in talking with them, I found out, oh, yeah, they smoked marijuana. Well, nowadays, marijuana is legal in a lot of places, including my home state of California. I don't know if it's legal here in New York State, but in many states it is legal. And people tend to use it more in gummy form or something now. But in California, man, you can get reefer madness almost anywhere these days because it's in the air. People are, well, they may say I, I wasn't a smoker, but you know, in my tender youth, of course I tried pot because everybody did. And that too, I mean, marijuana is known to have particular things in it that are in some ways worse than tobacco. 
And so they may not have deemed themselves a smoker, but if you, if you stop and talk with them and you find out that they were smoking marijuana, you go, uh-huh, so you actually were a smoker for a period of time. Well, gosh, I never thought about it that way. I just thought I was a drug user. Yeah, but the way you ingested the drug was through smoking. And crack might be another form of that, right? So anyway, in the couple of cases where I ran into it, we prayed about their marijuana use and the impact that that may have had in their lungs. And they went into remission. I don't, and they weren't, I wouldn't say it would be right to call them fully healed, but they went into remission and they got a new lease on life. And then I lost track of one of them. The other one is still in remission. So things like that are often overlooked. And this is why it's valuable to talk with people and to move a little bit slowly. And it's one of the reasons why when we do an altar call and, you know, 50 people come forward or 5,000 people come forward and you're just trying to lay hands on everybody, on the one hand, there's God's power and it's, it's, it's effective. It's God's power. But on the other hand, it doesn't really let you deal with these things that are entrenched in people's lives, which might actually be contributing to their situation. And so I'm all for big altar calls and seeing God's power fall and having people get touched. <clears throat> and many times people do get miraculous healings out of that, praise God. But there's this other side that sometimes we do way better to just have them come in and pray for them one-to-one -one or two-to-one and kind of dig up all of this storyline that would have otherwise never got been addressed. And even if it were brought up, are you going to have time to do it when you've got all these other people that you've got to get to at an altar call? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, are we ready to go? Oh, one way you got your hand in the air. Sure. Okay, one way you want the mic? Or are you going to yell? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, so Wenwei's a cancer researcher. He's asking about prostate cancer, and he said that what they see is that there's just clinically, numerically, a higher incidence of prostate cancer among African Americans than among other population groups. It wouldn't only be whites, it'd be Asians and others as well, right? Right, yeah. So it runs in the family. So. Um, The prostate is a, is a gland that's unique to men. You know, we're talking about things that are unique to women. Um, it's a gland unique to men because it's associated with the production of seminal fluid, and women don't need that. So um, what gives rise to pro uh, prostate cancer? There can, be, there can be several things, but one of the more common ones is um, anal sex. And a lot of times, uh, men have had these experiences. They don't necessarily talk about them. But again, everything that God commands, he does because he loves us and it's for our good. It's not because he's mean. It's not because he hates us. It's because he knows what's best for us. And we're in a mixed crowd, I'm aware, and I want to be sensitive to that. But when anal sex is going on... Um, Let's just say that the rectum and the tissues there can be highly absorbent of semen. I don't know how else to say it, so there you go. And when that particular practice goes on, uh, the semen can be absorbed into the body, and of course the prostate is down in that area where penetration occurs. And so sometimes there's an undiscussed, undisclosed history of homosexual activity. Sometimes, not always, I'm giving you roots. In the African American community, there is a um, term they use called on the down low. And uh, again, I don't wanna be accused of being a racist here. I have just have been around a lot and I've talked to a lot of people. And so I'm telling you some things I've seen. I'm not saying every black man is gay. That would be absurd. 
Um, but there are, uh, in the black community, some men who are bisexual, and they, as they say, live on the down low. So I would at least be asking questions about whether they have been engaged in that kind of activity. When you talk about the generational stack that you're experiencing as a researcher, I would be thinking about um, a couple of things. One is iniquitous roots that deal with, watch this, emasculation. Now, is it literally emasculating a man? Well, in some cultures, they would do that. In American slavery, I don't think we had particularly a tradition of turning black men into eunuchs. But there is very much an emasculating effect that goes on when someone is put into slavery. Is that not correct? They are robbed of their free will. They are robbed of their ability to, to well, Take that one away, cast it into the outer darkness. Okay, so, uh, so when men are enslaved, they're emasculated. Again, sometimes literally Daniel was, but for sure they're emasculated from the sense of even if they sire a family, they may not get to raise that family. Their wife can be taken from them, their children can be taken from them, sold away from them. They have no say in any of it. It's a very humiliating and demeaning experience. And so while it's not specifically dealing with the testes, the prostate and the testes are part of an integrated system just like the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder are an integrated system. So when you say that about black men, I didn't know that because I'm not a clinical researcher, but I'm not surprised to hear it. And I think that emasculating effect becomes a generational effect that's passing down. I think we're six generations now away from formal um, chattel slavery in America. Uh, so that's not so far away that I wouldn't expect to still see a, a statistically significant higher incidence of, uh, of prostate and even testicular problems among black men. And I would pray for it as an iniquitous root and cut the iniquity and then, and then pray for the physical healing. Does that make sense? Now, did I say that in a way that was sensitive and not racist? I, I hope that's how it came across. I mean, I'm aware I'm in New York City, and I don't want to, I'm not looking to be provocative. I'm simply trying to answer a question from a scientist about how do we think about this using what I've presented. All right, Matthew, you had the last question. scientific facts about cancer, I'm thinking about rebellion. Connection between rebellion and cancer. Do you have any experiences or patterns in your training with rebellion and cancer? Well, again, nothing is always and nothing is never, but yeah, I'd say I've seen enough incidents of rebellion uh, being tied to it, because what's happening, again, I'm, you have to kind of think about this in word pictures, but when the cells begin multiplying with no governance over them, you know, God created our bodies that, that cells only reproduce at certain times and under certain conditions, and they reproduce after their own kind. But when you get this kind of weird cell and it goes wild and takes over an entire area, well, that's not according to God's kingdom. That's not according to God's order. Those cells are in rebellion against the natural order. Does that make sense? Okay, if you follow that thinking, then when you think about what might 
give rise to that if that person is living in rebellion or has a family history of rebellion we could say rebelliousness well that might actually be in the root structure of the cancer i'm not saying everybody who gets cancer is rebellious but some part of it yes and it's not just some you know low percentage there can be this rebellion where the body is now responding to the spiritual or soulish input that's coming in and again we think about healing from an integrated perspective so what's manifesting physically may well be the bitter fruit of the underlying root and so think about when saul fails to carry out the command of the lord with regard to the amalekites the story is found in first samuel 15. and what does samuel say to him he says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft what did i tell you about liver cancer in many societies of the world but maybe not so much white american society because you don't tend to find as much witchcraft in white american society it's often at the root of liver cancer so in particular i would think if somebody's got liver cancer and you come from a, a, a community of people where witchcraft is around you might start looking at rebellion as a potential issue whether in your own life in your family's life in your in your ancestral uh, lineage maybe that's a route to the cancer that you're dealing with again maybe not always but it is something you would want to look at as you can see there's a lot here but note that everything i'm telling you in one way or another although i haven't looked at you know passage after passage after passage everything i'm giving you is predicated on the word of god these principles come out of the bible and we have we have been trained particularly in the western theological tradition to read the bible in a very linear um, analytic way and i think from the historical standpoint that's correct i mean we the bible also contains history and we need to take that history seriously but there are these spiritual dynamics that go on inside of the uh, the very words of scripture that are clearly there but we have been trained not to see them to exclude them and as a result we often miss them and if we can recover that we'll often find keys to healing that are there that we've not thought about and with it we can find more breakthrough all right i think that's all the teaching and talking for tonight we're going to do the praying now so uh i don't know about you guys but i'm like wow there's so much to think about i am i in my prior life i was a pancreatic surgeon Yeah, my pancreatic surgeon. So yeah. think about some of your patients that you have in your case history. Maybe you don't even know that piece of their case history because you never ask it of them, or you didn't think to ask it. Well, towards the end of my surgical career, I was, shall we say, pastoring as I as I was functioning as a surgeon, and you spend time with your Cancer patients, and I, I was, I was known as the praying surgeon in the hospital, and that was at a Catholic hospital, no less. So, um, you know, I heard, you'd be surprised, I heard lots of confessions from people, and it's 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 not uncommon. They had secrets, sins, and things, and like they had no one to talk to. So I stood in the place of many pastors and priests during those times. Now, I'm not doing surgery, I'm pastoring, but it's, we're still dealing with the same issues. Um, I wanna say to our friends on the online world um, that we are gonna be saying goodbye to you because the next part of tonight, we're going to do a demonstration case, but because of the privacy issue and the request of the prayer recipient, we're not broadcasting. So for those who've joined us online, I just want to say, you know, like, don't, don't be too surprised, but we have to turn the stream off now, and uh, we will see you sometime in a different way.
All right.